everybody. Welcome to the Lifetime Training Podcast. My name is Jason Stell, your host, as you know, and I've got the, our program manager at Lifetime of Nutritional Products, Mr. Paul Kriegler, and I can't wait for you guys to hear this story. Welcome to the show, Paul. Thanks for having me, Jason. Man, you know, Paul and I go way back in, you know, working together for a while now, and the one thing that I want everybody to really think about understanding here is we, we use the term quite a bit, health and fitness professional. And I think sometimes it gets mixed up and people are like, oh no, I'm a trainer or I'm a nutrition coach. And, you know, in, in this world, there's no better person than I know. I bet you there's nobody in the world in, or definitely in the States better than Paul as being a health and fitness professional, or he's taken his experiences as, you know, from a nutritional side, from a wellness and, and, you know, lab side and, and then the training side and, and mash that thing together to really be somebody who can help you. It doesn't matter what your thing is. So I just want to say thanks, you know, for being part of the team and, and for everything that you've done over the years, because I think a lot of it goes very hidden. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate the compliment. I, I, uh, I'm a little, I'm a little scared now. <laughs> no way, uh, man. Isn't it better to, over or under promise and over deliver. Yeah, and but, yeah, but you've been like over, you've been over delivering better. for a long time, brother. So <laughs> I, I think it's time for people to know. So, you know, I, I'd love to kick it off. You know, obviously this is part of the trainer series and for people to understand, you know, what there is out there and in what careers, true careers look like um, in the world, in our industry as a health and fitness professional. So if you wouldn't mind just starting from the beginning, man. And, and how did you get into this thing? And, you know, how did you get to where you are today? Well, if I go way back, I grew up as a very picky eater. So as an eight, nine, 10 year old, you know, a very picky palate, which kind of forced me into having to help prepare whatever I wanted to, to eat at home because my, my mom wasn't going to make you know, separate meals for me yeah. versus the rest of my family. So, so were you a picky uh, eater from the standpoint of, good but picky or not so good and picky no i was a junk food yeah me too (laughs) yeah (laughs) it was the same way i remember having a whopper before every basketball game so in high school so (laughs) we had this rule it was uh you can if you have to wash it or peel it you can eat as much as you want but if you have to unwrap it before you eat it you have to go outside and play afterwards and i hated that rule growing up but now it's like looking back that's good man that is a good rule um but yeah, I, I kind of got forced into, not forced, but that was my route. I had to somehow get comfortable in the kitchen. And I think it's one of the best things that I'm not a parent, but even watching my niece and nephews, uh, the more involved they get in either growing their food or, or preparing their food, the more you can help kids participate. Love that. The less, the less it becomes a battle, mm-hmm. you know, so that piece of advice I just got. I don't know why I never thought about that. That, that is what's being used at the Stella household from now on. <laughs> yeah. Um, but then I was, I was also active as a kid. So, you know, even though I was a picky eater and kind of got comfortable in the kitchen at a young age, one of my first jobs in high school was actually cooking in a restaurant. Wow. I was a line cook in a restaurant when I was 16, as soon as I could drive myself to work. So um, got familiar with the kitchen. And then as an athlete growing up, you know, the, the parallels between eating well and performing well just became super apparent. That's great. Um, I wasn't the greatest athlete as a, as a young kid, you know, kind of a B, B team hockey player. Um, I loved hockey, but um, I also ran track and cross country and that kept me a little too small to play, play <laughs> hockey safely in high school here in yeah. Minnesota. So, um, you know, going into college, I wanted to do something in the health and wellness space. I didn't know if that was physical therapy, athletic training, um, pre-med. Um, I was interested in nutrition. So as an undergrad, you know, I kind of took classes in all those lanes and the nutrition really stuck out to me. And I, you know, I'm really grateful for it because there's this whole industry of preventive wellness or well-being that's unfolding, you know, really in the last decade or so. Um, in a good way, you know, as many challenges as we have in the healthcare space in this country and across the world, it's like, you know, we're never going to have enough hospital caliber medical professionals to deal with the everyday health and wellness concerns of Americans. So yeah. we're going to have to have some kind of in-between space where um, 
it's a experienced and certified health coach or a trainer yeah. or a movement specialist or a nutrition coach who's not an RD. Um, you know, we're going to have to have some kind of middle ground industry that's focused on achieving health. And that doesn't, it doesn't at all disrupt the industry that's already in place to treat and manage disease. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so that, that middle lane is really exciting to be a part of. Well, and, and something you said there, I think that is worth definitely diving into is, is, you know, from your experience, what have you seen going to school? Cause you, you did finish school th- through becoming an RD, correct? Um, and so now you learned all the stuff that you learned and then you came into what you came into here at Lifetime and where, where is that disconnect? And what are the, the things that, you know, you're seeing, because, you know, it's not that we're bagging completely on the RD, but you know, there's, a, there's definitely a difference um, between what you're learning and, and where we're at and, you know, where the industry is going now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, you're right. I, I graduated from the university of North Dakota, um, their dietetic program, um, completed my internship as part of that program. And then immediately after college, I, I went into the clinical world. So I was a acute care um, registered dietitian working in all, all the departments of the hospital, you know, mm-hmm. you name it from pre and postpartum to intensive care, to psych, to long-term care, wow. you know, I did some long-term care consulting. So I saw the whole gamut of kind of the acute and step down in long-term care um, of medical nutrition therapy. And that's what RDs do. They specialize <laughs> in medical nutrition therapy. Um, and in school, I remember not learning much about what it takes to truly achieve health, which looking back on, it's kind of weird you know, you go <laughs> yeah. into a health related field. And all you're focused on is the disease specifics, wow. which is also necessary, right? Yeah, yeah for sure. Situations you need it. But, um, you know, after two years of, of that field, I knew I didn't want to spend my whole career there. And I knew I had some other skill sets like my experience as an athlete in college and coaching others, even in my, in my fifth year, I call it my victory lap in college. Um, <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> after, after my eligibility ended, I wanted to yeah. coach some, you know, I, I volunteer, volunteer coach at a high school up in Grand Forks. Yeah. But um, yeah, I knew that my career was better spent helping people prevent the lifestyle related diseases mm-hmm. that are so common, you know, and even in my, my own family history, I've got very high risk factors for high blood pressure, diabetes, cancer, alcoholism, heart disease. Yeah. You know, I kind of hit the, the opposite of the genetic, genetic lap, uh, <laughs> jackpot, if you ask me. Yeah. Um, but, you know, genetics load the gun and environment pulls the trigger. So, that. um, that's what brought me to the Lifetime. You yeah. know, even in college, I knew that Lifetime was hiring dietitians. I knew they staffed them. I interviewed with Lifetime before I went into the clinical world. Um, only to turn it down and, and really, really to get some relevant RD experience mm-hmm. before switching lanes and coming over to the health and wellness space. But yeah, I started with Lifetime uh, 12 years ago last week, actually. Congratulations, man. Yeah, yeah it's been a, over, well over a decade now yeah. um, at, at our Plymouth Club. I, so I, I worked as first as a trainer, even though I was a dietitian, my mm-hmm. department manager hired me, said, I'll, get, I'll hire you if you get a training cert. Yeah. So I got my training cert, got my NASM. Um, and then they immediately threw me into like a team weight loss class. <laughs> this is now our burn format um, yeah. to teach that as an RD. And I also spun up a triathlon training group, yeah. which actually the three years that I was at Plymouth, that was probably the, the best group of people that I could have learned how to be a good trainer and coach to adults. Yeah. You know, they were fantastic people and, you know, the fitness pros I worked with at, at that club are, a lot of them are still there, yep. you know, career, career fitness professionals. And For sure. Yelling in their lane. Um, that was a club too that, I mean, sprouted so many, so many people that have done so well in our industry, uh, definitely for us too. Mm-hmm. But long story short, you know, I, I, got, I got a really close up look at our healthcare system enough to learn that the route to a solid career and a, and a solid impact on the population is not through providing acute care for me. It yeah. was through helping people achieve 
their healthiest possible lifestyle in their circumstances as possible. And that's what drove me towards um, being a trainer, kind of being an entrepreneur at Lifetime. You know, Lifetime yeah. provides beautiful overhead, um, you know, some of the security that you need to start up your own business in yeah. terms of benefits and uh, career pathing and that sort of thing. And people, <laughs> people, right. yeah. yeah. Other fitness pros. Yeah. Learn from. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, that's, well, you know, so I guess, you know, you, you've been both, you've been the, the NC and the, and the trainer. It, would you mind going into the importance of, of seeing it from that way? And then, you know, especially, you know, from a, from a, the ability to sustain a living and, and make enough money, you know, uh, in this environment, I don't think it's a have to, but it's a nice to. And I think it's, you know, we've seen a lot of people grow and, and flourish, uh, but what can you give advice to those that maybe are nutrition coaches in, you know, so you can speed up their curve and potentially see them as a, a potential option here. Yeah, it's a, it's a loaded question. Um, you know, my first, my goal in coming to lifetime, knowing that it's, it's really a, it's an environment where you, the, the earnings potential is limitless. If you want to work a lot, you can in most cases. Um, but if you want to work smart, then, what you need to focus on is building really great relationships with people who might need your help or who know someone who might need your help. Um, so having good relationships with your potential customer base um, is really important. Uh, so much so that if, you know, I encourage all of our fitness professionals that ask me it when they come in, you know, what can I do? What can I do? You know, like where can I grab names to you know, people to call? And it's like, no, it's not, on, it's not on the list somewhere. <laughs> go out, go swipe cards at the front desk, treat everyone like family. Yep. And that's if the benefit. They, I mean, at the, at the end of the day, that that's why you want to work in the club. I mean, like I yeah. said, people is one of the biggest, if not the biggest, you know, benefits of working for the club is that you'll never run out of people. You just yeah. got to figure out a way to engage with them. Yeah. And I didn't come up with, with this on my own, you know, Dan Kelly in my new hire training class. Of course. <laughs> he, said, he said in life, people have three places that they feel comfortable. Usually one is home. Hopefully, it's, yeah. hopefully one is home. The second one is usually work just because, you know, as a society, we spend a lot of time at work. Mm -hmm. And the third place, he said, our jobs are to make lifetime that third place for people. And you, you see it, yep. you know, the, the, a lot of a lot of our clients who work with us and lead very demanding lives, their stop at lifetime every day is the highlight. It's the healthiest part of their day, yep. and it's a really important part of their day. Got so. it. Well, you know, so after you finish school, you know, you, you were clinical, then you come through us, mm -hmm. and you were kind of trainer slash NC. You know, what were the things that drove you and, and allowed you to go from club to you know, obviously running our, you know, nutrition products division. Um, <laughs> from a, from a subject matter standpoint, it was to question everything I learned in college. <laughs> um, you know, because that's, that's how you continue learning. It, yeah. It's um, looking back. I, I'm surprised that most nutrition programs in universities don't have incredibly deep dives into the world of nutritional supplements. I think it's a big miss. There's no better profession on the planet that should be heavy, heavily equipped with an understanding of dietary supplements. Because I, I know a lot of RDs that are in traditional RD roles, you know, think they're all just these dirty things that are completely unregulated and they want to stay as far away from them as possible. Well, if you step back and look at it from a 50,000 foot view, they're probably not going to go away. And almost everyone, especially people going to the gyms, almost everyone is taking them. And they're being driven to take them by, you know, some TV doctor or a neighbor who sells stuff through a multi-level marketing firm. Yep. Or it's, it's all just hearsay. There's, there's no responsibility for driving people to supplements in a way that's, you know, customized for them, or at least given to them in the context of a greater lifestyle plan that includes training, nutrition, sleep and stress management. I don't think any profession is, is 
it, it couldn't be more important to have dietitians be the experts yep. on nutritional supplements. So that required me to, to basically question everything. Why didn't we learn about supplements to, you know, to a deeper degree? Mm -hmm. There were these weird things that were available, but you only needed them if you, if you had a deficiency, you know, so it's almost like you have to get to the worst potential situation or scenario before yep. you even pay attention to that whole realm of stuff. Yeah. Um, it's, it's interesting. It's crazy. You know, I, uh, I went through, I, I think you may have gone through that, the FDN course, the, the functional diagnostic nutrition course. And, and the one thing that's, but that stood out for me is right in the beginning, they talked about it and talked about this when, when I had Jim Lavelle on, but he drew a straight line down with a, a line right through the middle of it. And he said, you know, allopathic medicine, but basically on the far left side is, is health. And then the far right side is death. And in the middle is your symptoms and, and how, you know, the allopathic industry or, you know, the people who are working once you get a disease or once you get a symptom, you're only trying to get them asymptomatic. So you don't really work on, on the beginning stages that have led you to get this symptom, which would then lead to a disease, which would then potentially lead to death. And it's just baffling that that's how it works, that that's how people are looking at it or the, the general population of, of doctors and stuff out there that are, you know, really taught to treat disease, not how to extend life and, you know, from, from a, from a health standpoint, so you don't get the disease. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah, there isn't, there's enough, um, you know, to the credit, that's how we have to be set up right now. Yeah. You know, the, the, the allopathic medicine world is, it is pretty highly efficient. Yeah. You know, uh, there's a lot of sick people out there. There's a lot yeah. of people that have metabolic dysfunction and we can go round and round about, you yeah. know, what brought that on. But the fact of the matter is, you know, you go to the doctor's office, they absolutely have to, you know, they're basically yeah. as quickly as possible <laughs> they have to... helping you avoid hospitalization and, you know, further critical care. And, and that's, that's a very important function of that world. Yeah. Um, what pains me is, you know, like health and wellness, for example, is most of those businesses are categorized as entertainment businesses in the same business category and regulatory category as amusement parks and golf courses yeah. and bars. And <laughs> it's weird. Yeah. yeah. It's odd. yeah. Um, but we, you know, just as well, I do, you go out and ask, any number of your clients if they get tired after meals or they feel bloated more often than they'd like to or um, they're depending on caffeine you know those things aren't normal they're very common but they're not normal um, so it's that's that's the wheelhouse of health and wellness professionals yep. to catch people where they don't feel great maybe they didn't feel like junk but they also don't fall into these categories that some kind of medication or procedure is going to make them radically improve their status. You know, it might slow down the progression to the worst of the worst, but it doesn't really push people back on the spectrum towards health unless they also do something with their exercise and their sleep and their maybe supplementation and, and their diet, especially. Yeah. Well, you know, it kind of leads into, you know, and I'm very curious from your perspective. I know, you know, we talked about this, uh, you know, prior to the recording is, you know, one of the biggest benefits that Lifetime has offered me through this, actually this month was 18 years for me, was, was the fact that it put me, it allows me to do the things I'm doing today. Like I'm getting to talk to people that I would never have been able to probably reach or nobody would have ever talked to me if I didn't have that name behind me. And, you know, it's just amazing what we've learned and the people that we brought in. I'd love for you to share, you know, that aspect of your career where you came in knowing what you knew, following the people that you knew. And then all of a sudden you came in a lifetime. And I know when you started to where we are today, it's a whole, whole different ball game, I'm, I'm sure. So, you know, what were the ways in which lifetime were, you know, allowed you to grow, learn from people that maybe you would not have been able to, to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with, or even learn from? That's a great question. The, I mean, the, the list is extremely long, mm -hmm. probably like yours would be. Yeah. Uh, but I think the biggest turning points for me as a subject matter expert, like fitness professional, dietitian, nutrition nerd, you know, whatever you want to yeah. title me there, 
would be Bob Sibahar. Mm -hmm. So reading his book as I was going through his first book, Metabolic Efficiency Training. Yeah, I remember that. While I was going through the initial months of, of uh, training at Lifetime and applying our metabolic testing data, so our, our active metabolic assessment yeah. data to my own marathon training program. Um, that was very eye-opening. Um, I trained for Boston Marathon in 2010. And, you know, I was, I was a good division two collegiate runner. Jumping to marathon is a completely different animal, <laughs> um, especially when you're working 50 plus hours a week as a fitness professional. But applying his metabolic efficiency training for that marathon buildup, I not only got stronger, I added lean muscle mass and I trained probably about half the volume in terms of miles per week than a lot of the people I was running the race with. Wow. So I, you know, just by sheer like amount of time I had, I had to condense everything that I was doing from a training standpoint into like 45 miles a week. Wow. Um, and I ran 250 at Boston. Oof. <laughs> on 40 to 45 miles a week. And I got leaner and stronger um, while training for a marathon. Most people lose muscle tissue when they train for a marathon, but I was able to maintain it. So Bob Sibahar was a big turning point, very convincing, having gone through that experience myself. And then seeing some of the principles I was testing my, myself on yep. caused these dramatic shifts in metabolic health and performance and body composition in my clients at the same time without too much effort. You know, it wasn't, it didn't, it didn't create the need to count calories or anything like that. Um, well, and, and that's the, that, oh, go ahead. That kind of coincided with having a lot of close contact with Jim Laval. Mm -hmm. I, I call, I call him uncle Jim. Still Jim yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's mind blowing how he, he's able to, to basically, reteach you what you learned in college but in a dis different context so yeah. everything i learned in nutritional biochemistry and advanced nutrition and medical nutrition therapy and um and applied physiology all those things just started to explode in concert in my head as if i'd never taken the course before but i got a's in those courses in college and i loved them i geeked out on i studied until 11 12 at night every night reading those textbooks but then going through it with Jim, it was, it was a completely different level. Now I was able to apply it to clients. Yeah. Um, and John Berardi, you know, so that gets super technical. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so there's the practical influence that um, learning from Bob Sibahar allowed me. There was the very technical stuff that I, I took away from Jim Laval and then um, more of the real world kind of reality check from John Berardi. Saying like, yeah, even if you are a PhD in nutrition, like he is, that still doesn't make your client have protein every morning or make it a reality when they have four kids running around. Like that's your job as the coach. You need to make it so stupid easy that they can't fail. That's awesome. Yep. From a behavior change standpoint. So I think those were the biggest things that helped me gain enough confidence as a coach that not only did I know enough, I knew what worked and what maybe didn't work through application and trial and error. And then had the confidence to say like, no, we need to start here. We'll get to, you know, part N later on, but right now we're doing our A, Bs and Cs. Yep. Um, from John Berardi. Well, and you know, the thing that I just am so impressed and applaud too is th there's people that go and learn and then there's the people that go and learn apply in what they're doing and then evolve even what they're learning. And that's one of the things that I think, you know, you've been able to do and you've been able to help the organization do um, to be able to actually, you know, have trainers do lab testing and then you're, you know, reading those things and interpreting them so that then the trainer can go back and do what they need to do better. And just how we've intertwined that. So that's one point that, you know, really stuck out in my head. And then the other thing is, we're not talking about going and learning a textbook or reading. This is personal interaction with Bob, with Jim, with John that you've had, that you've had one-on-one -on -one conversations with uh, on top of the, the countless, you know, road shows that I know Bob did. And I know Jim did. Uh, I can't remember if John did any, um, 
but you know, that, that's the stuff that I think, you know, I don't take for granted. I know you don't. And, and, you know, that just is allows us to, you know, I always say we're pretty much lifers after this point, you know, even though I had a little hiatus, but you know, I know that if I had to go back and train with everything that I've learned and all the interactions that I've had to, if, if I go back and do that, then so be it. And I'll still be able to make a great living and, and love doing it. So that's awesome. Well, yeah. Yeah. I mean, without having to personally spend a dime on any of that, that yeah. that's a benefit that never shows up in any statements that we get from lifetime. Yeah. It's an incredible one. Well, so and that's incredible. what I, I always tell you to talk to trainers too. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm going to have it spelled out, but you know, th- there's a percentage obviously that we give away, but it's better than anyone else in the industry. We could say that, but if you take the hours of travel, the hours of gas, you know, that you have to go back and forth of how to get a client, the, the marketing dollars. Now you're talking education. I'm going to say that it, it's a wash or very close to it. If you, if you take advantage of it, obviously there's a lot of people that don't take advantage of those other things. And, and then it's, it's not so, and it's not for everybody. We get that. Um, but those people the, the opportunity to, I always say have a career that you can retire from in this industry it is not a common thing and not many organizations I think allow it. And we definitely, I think have and, and do, um, and we continue to evolve it. Um, you know, obviously we're, we're talking like everything's roses right now. And I know I've had my ups and downs. You've probably had your ups and downs and, you know, and, and I think what's great about, you know, what you've done is you've learned from it. So would you mind sharing some experiences that, you know, you know, it could be good. And then some that maybe weren't the best, but that you learned along the way that's allowed you to be who you are and allow you to get to the position that you're in now. Yeah. That's another loaded question, Jason. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I was, I mean, I was terrible when I came in as, as a trainer at first at lifetime and um, in terms of sales, I mean, every, Everyone has to sell something every day, even if it's an idea or a convincing compliment to someone yeah. like they have to believe that you mean it. Yeah. And that to me is a sale. So I was always afraid of sales in the traditional sense. Likewise. And that held me back in the beginning, but I had some really great leaders in the club and Billy's still at, at Eden Prairie that helped me out kind of break through that and say like, you know, you're really helpful for people. People have nothing but good things to say, even if they don't come out of your office after signing a contract. Um, He said, you'll get it. Like you'll have a career here. Um, So having leaders stick with you was an incredible boost to confidence. And then Tom Nicola, who's not here anymore, but he's, he's been a a close mentor of mine Mm -hmm. in the health and wellness space and always quick to put me and other people on the team here on, on a pedestal. He never wants credit for his own, his own, but, um, you know, his, his belief that we have exactly what it takes to move the health of our communities, wherever we have clubs Mm -hmm. forward. Um, and actually we probably have what it takes now to move the health of any community forward, any community that has access to the internet. Yeah. You know, we could probably provide them with enough motive, education, motivation, and inspiration to improve their sta- their health status. That to me is cool. Now you're creating an impact. Um, you know, it's not always easy and there's a lot of hiccups along the way, but um, that's really fulfilling for me to know that I'm making an impact is, uh, I think everyone wants to know that. Yeah. So. Yeah. Got it. I don't know if I answered your question. Directly. No, no. Yeah. I mean, it, these are the, the people and the experiences that led you to, to where you are today. I mean, you know, I, I know some of the times when, you know, when I left and I fell flat on my face, you know, and, you know, after about a year, that was personally, you know, that turned into professionally, you know, I, I needed some stuff to take care of, you know, personally when that happened and it punched me in the face and here I am living in California with a family and no money. <laughs> so, you know, those, those types of situations um, and taking, getting myself out of being comfortable by, by moving the whole family to California and, and taking that risk. And I, and I learned a ton about me and who I was and who I didn't want to be as well as who I wasn't and I want to be. <laughs> so, you know, some of those things that I, I think play a, a huge role, um, you know, and, and like I said, us being appreciative and grateful for where we are today and, and seeing the positives of, of 
what the companies or people work, for, you know, that, that we work for and work with. Yeah. Um, I remember time. being super thrilled for you to be jumping at that opportunity. Yeah. You got a chance to step away from here. You, you and I were cubicle neighbors. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And then you were doing that adventure. And uh, when you came back, it was, it was tremendous to see that you came back and you immediately have an impact. Thanks. I appreciate it. Well, you know, I guess to be, before we dive into what what's in the hopper for the nutritional side, um, cause I think we've got some amazing stuff coming down the pipe. Um, you know, what would you give, you know, as maybe one or two specific pieces of advice for the, you know, the trainer and C combo to, to really think about when coming here and, and, you know, having a true successful career that they can retire from. Uh, I think first and foremost is treat every client like they're a family member. Um, if you do that, then you'll, as a trainer or a nutrition coach or a fitness professional, as I like to call them, what immediately happens in your own mind is you take more responsibility for providing the right education at the right time, the right motivation at the right time, um, and the right redirection at the right time. You know, knowing that as a trainer, if somebody's hired you to get them closer to their goals, you've got to take more responsibility for that than, than maybe you feel comfortable with right now. Mm-hmm. And that's okay. But realize that when they leave your sessions, those clients are going to go out into this big bad world of confusing information. And they're still going to have questions about what to have for lunch. They're still going to have questions about what to take or what to throw away from their supplement cabinet. Um, and as a trainer, take responsibility and at least have professional influence. You don't have to be salesy about it. And I think that's maybe the most off-putting part of the supplement industry yeah. is how, how most supplement companies are, they're just marketing companies that happen to sell supplements. Mm-hmm. They're not supplement companies that happen to have a little marketing. Uh, so that it's, their setup is flipped in the bad direction. And, and you can see that too. So many of them, they have a show, they have a, a life where they're on top of the world and then all of a sudden, boom, they just either disappear or it's a slow death to the business going away. Where I live, I'm not going to name names, but I'm very, very close to one of the biggest. Um, and it's that the, the corporate offices I heard is like a ghost town <laughs> right now. Um, you know, so bummer. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, trainers, you know, I, and I, I think trainers should talk about nutrition. I'm very passionate about that. I'm not, I'm not one of these RDs that's saying no one should talk about nutrition at all unless they have an RD credential because mm-hmm. we'll never have enough RDs to address the needs that, you know, the greater population has. Everyone has questions about their own nutrition. Everyone's nutrition changes as they go through a health and fitness journey. You know, the, the amount of carbs I need today is going to be totally different than when I'm building up for my next event. Like yeah. every individual has unique needs at unique stages of their program or process. And if you don't take responsibility for influencing some of those choices your clients make between sessions, they're going to get that information from somewhere else. And most likely that somewhere else is going to be completely clueless to the inner work. Instagram. The program. <laughs> yeah. So you know, as, a, as a trainer, you're trying to manage in an intelligent way. You're trying to manage total exercise program load, right? Like frequency, intensity, time type. You're also programming, you know, a lot of our fitness pros are wizards at this. Yep. Um, exercise selection, sets, reps, tempo, exercise order, you know, all those finer acute variables of the exercise program. And to do that much work and not teach people exactly what they should be eating before and after their training sessions, or maybe teach them enough about nutrition so that they start crowding out some of their bad choices. Um, It's, it pains me to see that much time wasted. Well, and, and the thing that, you know, also happens is at the end of the day, that's, that's, that's holding you back from getting the results. So if the person comes back to you and says, I'm not getting the results, 
it, it, and you're like, well, I wrote you the best program in the world. It, it, it doesn't matter. So you're allowing this person to go get their information on nutrition somewhere else because you choose to say, I, that's not me. I'm just this training guy. But then you're leaving the results of this person up to somebody else. And then when they let you go because they're not getting results, mm -hmm. you know, then you're saying, well, it wasn't me. You know, my program was perfect. So it's, you know, it's, it's how you got to understand how if you're not comfortable doing it, at least find somebody who is that you can recommend them to so that at least you guys can have the conversation, right? You know. Exactly. And I've, you know, and you've seen this too. We even see, um, I've interacted with trainers and it's usually a, a, a fantastic interaction because yeah. I love to, to discuss this with, with trainers and they're like, I, I can't handle it. My client travels all the time. They're eating out at restaurants all the time. Great. Bring up the menus. Yeah. Like there are solutions in every, almost every circumstance where you can move them along on the spectrum to be a little bit better. Yeah. Just, Let's just dig in and take that responsibility then. Um, Cause to your point, you might be lucky to have three, what I'd consider a workouts a week, you know, and then the B's yeah. are, the C's are more like recovery or active yeah. recovery. They're, they're not really doing anything to advance you forward in your fitness, yeah. but a B workout would be like, now you're maintaining skills or fitness. Uh, and a would be like that challenging stimulus. You're getting after it. Yep. To, create change in your body. Mm -hmm. Well, you're lucky if you have three of those workouts a week, but most people I know are going to eat at least 21 times a week. There you go. And can, you, yeah. can you try to get 17 of those 21 to be like on plan? That's 80% of them. Yeah. If you're there, it's really hard to screw up your progress. And, and again, your value increases. So maybe you're not writing macros, but you're telling them what to get in and out of their, their, refrigerator and their pantry so that, you know, they're not going after a beef sandwich, you know, because they're hungry and there's, it's staring them in the face and now you just lost. Teach them how to order their bowl at Chipotle. Yeah. Yeah. That's <laughs> awesome. Well, you know, to, to top it off, I, I like to do two things. One is, you know, just talk a bit about where nutrition products was when you came here to where they are today, you know, and just the differences and, you know, how we've chose who we, actually work with and, and manufacture through. I think that's super important to understand how we separate ourselves. And then, you know, if, if you got some stuff you can release around some new products that are coming out, um, that'd be awesome too. Yeah, sure. So when I came to Lifetime, we had, um, we still had artificial sweeteners. So this was 2008. Artificial sweeteners in our protein products, ACE-K. Um, I don't think there was aspartame, but it was like sucralose, Splenda. Yeah. Um, so what I've seen happen to our line and our formulas, even when I was at the club, we had migrated into all natural formulas. So no artificial sweeteners, um, no chemical flavorings, those sorts of things. So the last decade we've been one of the cleanest and we were the, one of the first lines to fully transition there. Now a lot of the industry is caught up and, and that is a bragging point of the majority of of brands that are still around, which is great mm -hmm. to see like the whole industry really save from a few big players has transitioned into healthier versions of sweeteners and flavor systems and that sort of thing. Um, so when I came to lifetime, it was just kind of another product on the shelf, but we at least knew what was in it. And that's, mm -hmm. that's why the whole line, I think you went through this with Jeff on the previous yeah. podcast. Um, that's why we did our line in the first place back in the early two thousands. Yeah. Um, but yeah, when we vet, you know, contract manufacturing partners, because we don't own our own plant, we don't have volumes big enough to, to take up that much produ production time, but we like to do it as a partnership. You know, we've, we've worked with some really great companies before and then got connected through them, uh, with other contract manufacturers that, you know, where our capsules are made in Oregon. They're, they can run far, uh, over the counter pharmaceuticals down the s very same lines. So they're set up as a FDA inspected and regulated over the counter pharmaceutical quality level manufacturer. Wow. They happen to have most of their business in the dietary supplement industry. So if the supplement industry ever went away, they, they could switch over and start making Advil. You know, like that's the quality that we're looking for yeah. in our manufacturing partners. And we keep them honest. Um, you know, they do some really great testing of 
of our ingredients before they bring them into their facilities. Uh, they test our formulas when they're, once every ingredient specified is blended together. And then they test them again as finished goods products. And then we randomly select products right off our shelves to send in to a third party to, to test and make sure that our manufacturing partners are honest. So we're going above and beyond. And a lot of, a lot of our product cost is in that more secure supply chain, better quality ingredients. Um, we actually, I don't even manage a marketing budget. I don't have a budget for marketing our products, yeah. um, which is completely backwards in the supplement industry. Yeah. <laughs> but if you, if you work in my cubicle with me, you'll understand yeah. why. Yeah. <laughs> it's because all the money we, we make on our products goes to either support our team members or to make sure our products stay high quality. That's we don't fantastic. Need the glamour of paid ads and that sort of thing. Like that's just not our bag. Uh -huh. So, um, do you have questions about that or? You no, no, that's perfect. That's perfect. You know, I, I guess, you know, the last thing before we wrap up is, is just really, you know, what's, what do we, what can you release that is going to be coming into the future? Well, uh, later this year, we're, you're going to see, um, I think probiotics will be the first product to come out. Um, it's the same formula, but we're, we're redoing all of our packaging. Got it. Um, there was, there was a, a project that we opened even before this pandemic hit um, that's just now coming to fruition. So think about that, working on projects a year in, adv in advance, yeah. more or less. Um, that's why maybe some people, some trainers on the, uh, that listen to the podcast maybe haven't heard from me in a long time. Yeah. I'm mostly behind the scenes for lifetime training and lifetime. Um, but we're doing all new packaging. So it's going to be a nice, clean, modernized look. Um, we're going to, and part of that switch is actually um, some environmental friendliness. You know, we're going away from some custom colors into stock bottles, which improves production efficiency. Good. We're adjusting the sizes and the shapes of the containers to use less plastic. I don't know exactly how much less yeah. quite yet, but to use less plastic and it's all recyclable. Um, and then just to make the line look more uniform too, yeah. you know, we've had a number of smaller changes over the last five years or so, uh, where, you know, we look at the whole assortment and it, there's enough differences in the, in the different generations of product updates, um, that it doesn't all look the same right now. Got it. So it's all going to look the same. Um, we reworked a couple formulas. All of our protein powders are going to be better than they ever were awesome. in terms of flavor profile. You know, the, the main raw ingredients are exactly the same, but um, it's been three plus years since we've approached the flavor, the natural flavor system and the sweetener system. Um, so we're actually coming out with a whole new powder suite that is naturally flavored and we'll have a no added sugar in oh, our nice. powder suite, which is really cool. Uh, and they taste, you know, blind taste testings here at the office, people, now they see me with like an armful of shaker bottles and they're like, <laughs> no more, no more. Um, but all of them in blind tastings, hands down, beat our current powders, which are pretty darn good. Yeah. Um, we've got an upgraded amino product and uh, a next generation pre-workout which I oh, think nice. people are going to be really thrilled with. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, Pre-workout and awesome. the strength stack is going to be all new, but that's going to come a little bit later. The immune stack is really timely. Oh, that's so right. We started cranking on that last February before COVID was COVID. And now well, it's coming now out. It's more important. Awesome. Yep. And when, and what's the estimated on that one? You know, probably start popping onto to cafe shelves in early January. Got it. Online will be just probably just before that. Perfect. Perfect. Well, Paul, man, I, I can't thank you enough. I and mean, your story is fantastic. And, you know, what you're doing behind the scenes to allow us to stay healthy and, and continue on to improve our health, not just stay healthy, but, uh, you know, improve it during everything that we're going through is, is fantastic. So um, anything else you have to share or anything else you want to, you know, say to the group before we leave? No, I, I, I think it's fantastic um, what you're doing with the podcast. And I'm a listener. Thank um, you. 
I'm honored that you invited me on what, within the first 15 or so. Yep. Um, you, you could have easily pushed me further down. <laughs> <laughs> no, man, I appreciate it. And like I said, I, I really respect the lot of you. You've given me some amazing advice to uh, along the years. So I, I can't thank you enough. Um, and, you know, thanks for being on the show and, you know, hopefully I'll get to Minnesota soon to see everybody in person. <laughs> if not, you could, you know, Dodge and I here, our head chef. Yeah. He, well, he's, he's muscling me into signing up for the Leadville stage race in July. So oh, boy, throw it out here publicly on the podcast. You should wow. Wow. That. I haven't rode in a while, but I've been saying I want to, and I've got a mountain that's not far from me at all. So I should, I've got really no excuse outside of the, uh, I might have to do that. I'm not going to commit yet, but I might have well, to do that. <laughs> not, to, not, not to push it on you a little bit more, but I've ridden a mountain bike on a trail. I can count the times on one hand. Okay. I don't have to do, but, but my stage won't be the, what, what's the straight up and down? Uh, Columbine, I think it's called. <laughs> oh, Columbine? No, yeah. that's not the stage race. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it's the real course. It's just divided okay. over three days. Oh, okay. I just thought that like you, you could just do that section. I don't have to do that section. <laughs> <laughs> we'll all write it together. Uh, days to maybe, maybe hours. that wouldn't be bad. I'll, I'll think about that. Uh, I, I it would get me back in shape for sure. Not back in shape, but in, in elite shape, I guess I would say. So, well, okay. I'll think about it. <laughs> you're going to have to write up that diet. You're going to have to write up that plan though for me. <laughs> we'll pick you up. All right, sir. Well, thanks again, brother. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Jason. Be good, man. Stay safe. You too.